Mitten da, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar, which is a first for me, and um, I'm sure it's a first for many of you too. I can see many of you have already joined the chat that goes with this webinar on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, feel free to use it to ask questions, chat to each other during this live broadcast. The whole webinar is going to be available recorded straight after we finish. And um, as we go along, I'm going to be playing some music and sharing some clips. So fingers crossed um, th that will all go smoothly. There will be some short pauses in between me talking and switching to the clips and also the uh, audio. If at any point um, you experience any glitches, uh, try and refresh your browser. Uh, the link for this webinar stays the same, both during the live broadcast and afterwards. So just keep heading back to that link if you are having any problems. Um, do shout if I have forgotten to turn my mic back up after sharing some audio and video with you. And um, we'll see how we go. So let's get started. Um, this webinar is about uh, the history of Cornish traditional music very much through women's eyes. Um, it's going to be very much an overview of um, some of the key um, highlights and some of the um, music that we uh, have in the Cornish tradition uh, very much through women's eyes and women's testimonies. The whole uh, webinar is part of a much larger project. And um, as some of you are commenting already, we were expecting to do a series of workshops. So this is uh, very much an experiment to see whether we can take this project uh, online. And the project is brought to you by the Hypatia Trust, and it's called uh, the Women of Cornish Music. So if you want to know more about that and what's um, happening throughout the projects in the coming weeks and months, do head over to the Hypatia Trust website. The leader of the project is uh, Florence Brown, who is here with us today. And uh, it's kindly supported by the National Heritage Lottery Fund and also Cornwall Heritage Trust. So um, let's start, I think, with sharing some wonderful Cornish traditional music with you. So short pause. <laughs> Wasn't that just the most wonderful and exciting um, uh, image uh, and sounds to see and experience? So what I shared with you now is um, um, a um, video of a Nosloan or a happy night, which has um, become very much part of uh, the Cornish musical tradition and the experience of it. Um, and that was uh, uh, an event led by Skilly Wooden, formerly the Dalla Band, um, about whom we'll hear more later. And we've got uh, Hilary Coleman here with us today, who we'll also hear from uh, a bit more later. Um, and this is very much for me um, a, a really great example of where we're at with Cornish traditional music today. It's alive, it's contemporary, it's addictive, mesmerizing, emotional, diverse. I've heard people say it's, it's like home, it's us. Um, all of those things uh, that music makes um, us feel part of our identity. And certainly um, th that is a great um, and um, very exciting example of that and how traditional music doesn't um, always have to be um, stayed and stuck in the past. However, we do have um, a, a fine historical tradition of social music 
Um, and this is probably a good um, point to say something about what I think Cornish traditional music is. Um, I think uh, efforts to try and define it are quite difficult and uh, music's very personal. It will mean very different things to different people. So I think of Cornish traditional music as the tunes and songs enjoyed by the community for their own sake, primarily. And mainly we're looking at vernacular or non-religious music in nature, although there is a crossover, which we'll hear about as well. Um, music that's played by folk uh, for other folk. And I'm searching for the women who have really shaped the identity of Cornish traditional music we recognize recognized today. Situated uh, in the modern Celtic traditional music family uh, in very much a living tradition that I now find myself in too and it's very exciting. Um, and um, these sometimes include tunes and songs that are found elsewhere in other traditions and are shared uh, here in Cornwall as well. Um, Today, I only have the opportunity to introduce some um, sort of basic concepts and uh, basic examples. And for every example I'm sharing with you and um, every bit of uh, thought that I'm sharing with you, there'll be several uh, other examples. And uh, following this webinar, I'll be putting a whole host of resources and links on the cornishtrad.com um, blog so you can explore further some of the music and some of the women I'm talking about in more detail. So my tale of Cornish traditional music is very much uh, one of continuity and a recreation and we'll touch on some ideas around revival. The whole concept of revival um, is hotly debated uh, in, in all genres of traditional music, whether it's in Cornwall or Ireland, Scotland, Wales, or wherever. Um, but the co whole concept of revival and revivals, I think we'll, we, we need to have a whole uh, new webinar on. Uh, so my story is very much um, about continuity and recreation. And the period that I'll be covering starts roughly in the 18th century and continues up to the present day. Um, it's important to remember uh, Cornwall's historical context during this time uh, as an outward facing land, very much open to international contacts uh, along the Atlantic seaboard and beyond. And for the most part, uh, its people are making music for their own entertainment, including music, song and dance. And the sources that I've delved into have come from a variety of places, from published collections of tunes and songs, newspapers, archives and interviews. And throughout the webinar, I'll mention several names of collectors, authors, websites, and publications. And uh, as I mentioned, a full list of these will be available um, along with the recording of um, this webinar, both on the Hypatia Trust website and also the CornishTrad.com uh, blog as well. I'm featuring uh, music from several different artists uh, by their kind permission. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge their generosity in letting me use those. And I, uh, I would um, ask at this point, especially in these uh, precarious times for writers, creative people and musicians, please do consider supporting them by buying their books and CDs and paying to download their music where possible. So let's have some more music. Short pause. <laughs> Thank you. 
So the music you've just heard um, is a beautiful uh, little tune called Mrs. Wollaston's Minuet. And it comes from the album um, called from uh, the Pride of the album Pride of Place. And I have it here today. And it was recorded by um, Mark O'Connor on the fiddle and Barbara Griggs on the harp. Now, Connor um, has pioneered uh, modern musical manuscript research uh, in Cornwall over the last few decades, uh, locating and making available hundreds of tunes from the late 17th to the 19th centuries. And some of these manuscript books are held in private collections. So his making them available to us today, to musicians and researchers, um, it makes it all the more precious. And um, among the um, manuscript books that Mike has uh, discovered, um, some names and titles and places that they come from include John Giddy of Key, the Morville Manuscripts from Morville House near Loo, the Book of Francis Prideau Brun, where this tune, Mrs. Wollaston's Minuet, came from, John Old of Parr, Dancing Master, William Allen of St. Ives, Gregory Tom of St. Irvin and Mary Bodger's scrapbook. Um, turning to uh, Francis Prideau Brun of Padstow's music book, obviously um, uh, Francis is one of the um, women that I'm featuring here. She collated a music book that um, dates roughly from between 1788 and 1804. Uh, and so the minuet you've just heard uh, comes from her collection. And it's a, it's a book of dance tunes, minuets, which are, which are similar to waltzes uh, and country dances arranged for the piano and possibly one other melody instrument. Um, it contains nationally known tunes from the time together with ones probably written by Frances um, for her friends or to celebrate colleagues or family members. Uh, she started the book when the family s still lived in Bath, but it was completed in Padstow. Um, and this is another great example of how traditional music travels between places, gets adapted, and then gets, gets absorbed into the tradition. Um, Mike says uh, that she, Frances owned probably one of the first pianos in Cornwall, dating back to 1788, a Longman and Boderup piano. And of the other women of the 18th century that are also visible in these manuscripts, we can take a look at the Morville manuscript and um, uh, a, a certain uh, woman called Anne Little. Now, the Morville manuscripts um, come from the private archive of the Carew Pole family. Um, but it was originally owned by the Buller family of Morville House near Loo. And the tunes in that book date from around 1740 to around 1770. And one song is dated 1767 and is named for a certain Anne Little and highlights parish harmony singing, which we also know um, went on throughout the 18th and 19th century as a particular feature of uh, Cornish music. And O'Connor speculates that Anne and her friends were taught by an itinerant singing master called Peter Quiller. And I think it's really interesting to um, uh, ask ourselves when we look at uh, women in music is who did they learn from and how did they pass on their musical knowledge to others? And then we also have um, Mary Bodger's book, uh, again, from a private collection, uh, also affectionately known as Aunt Mary's Scrapbook. And this has a couple of pages of music associated with the Bodger family of Walston House in Antony. And it has handwritten tunes as well as printed editions of wider known tunes. Um, and this very much seems to be a feature of the kind of music books that um, Mike O'Connor has uh, discovered from the 18th and early 19th centuries. Time for some more music, so another short pause. <laughs> Thank you. 
just heard um, a version of the tune uh, that we more commonly known as Nine Brave Boys today. And it's from a recording, uh, again by Mike O'Connor, from his album Kovath, The Lost Music of Cornwall. Um, Nine Brave Boys has a really interesting story, and I'm sharing with you here, I hope you can see it, a copy of the manuscript from which the, the tune we know today is based on. Nine Brave Boys is also known as Flowers of the Valley, and you'll find throughout any musical research, particularly in traditional music, that um, uh, tunes have several different names quite often. Um, and uh, I chose Nine Brave Boys because it's a great example of the importance of women in the collecting and communicating of our music. And this tune was taken down originally by um, a, a lady called Mary Gilbert, who took it down from a version sung by Thomas Williams, who was at the time an old man of uh, 90 years old back in, um, uh, who died in 1881. So, his own memory, a 90-year-old man, stretches well back into the early part of the 19th century and probably before that. And um, it's contained in a manuscript uh, copy of Sabine Bering Gould's Songs of the West. Um, many of you may know of Songs of the West, but for those of you who don't, Sabine Bering Gould's um, publication Songs of the West, Music of Devon in Cornwall, um, has been very influential in shaping the canon of Cornish traditional music we know today. Um, and a number of his other informants or communicators were women as well. And they were able to recall tunes and words sung by fathers, grandfathers, mothers and grandmothers. And published editions are found in his Songs of the West, which was originally published in around 1893. And then the whole book gets heavily revised and republished in the early 20th century, um, very much part of the folk revivals uh, going on in the early 20th century across the uh, British Isles. Another um, collector who um, you, um, cites very many women as the sources of music is Ralph Dunstan. And again, uh, Ralph Dunstan is, an, uh, is the name of another collector that those of you who are familiar with the Cornish music scene will um, have heard of. But for those of you who aren't, um, have a look at um, Ralph Dunstan's book called Liver Cano Canuek, or the Cornish Songbook, that was um, originally published in 1929. Again, a heavily influential book in um, shaping the Cornish traditional music we know today. And several uh, women are acknowledged as sources for remembering um, remembering different songs and tunes. And some examples uh, include a song called Merlin the Diviner. And that was first sung by uh, a Mrs. Radburn Fuller of Perrinporth at a meeting of the Royal Institution of Cornwall in Truro on the 6th of December, 1927. And uh, Dunstan actually describes it as a Breton incantation. And we do find um, many comparisons being made between um, the style of Cornish music and singing and that of the Bretons and Brittany. Um, another song, a very old one, is the Old May Day Carol, um, which is similar to the Old Waits Carol, for those of you who um, know your carols and carol music. And Dunstan remembered it from verses sung by his wife's mother and grandmother of the Trelaw family of Helston. Another um, woman uh, mentioned by Dunstan is, um, uh, for, is the song Lovely Nancy. Now, we've got lots of Lovely Nancys in uh, many uh, Cornish and indeed uh, other folk songs. But Lovely Nancy was believed to have been the young lady mentioned um, in um, Hunt's romances of the west of England. Now, Hunt um, collected and wrote down and uh, um, embellished slightly and 
to a great extent, several folk tales, um, uh, many of which originated in Cornwall. Time for some more music, a short pause. That a tune that you've heard, um, it's another one from Mike O'Connor's album Kovath, and it's based on a hymn or carol called God's Dear Son. Um, and I, I chose this example because I wanted to share with you um, that concept that uh, religious music and secular music may not have had the um, strong divide as sometimes we're led to believe. Um, and uh, this version was published and I've shared with you um, a, a screen showing the music as published by Davis Gilbert in his collection of carols published in 1822. And then later he publishes it again in 1823 with an appendix of um, other songs and tunes of a, uh, perhaps a more um, secular nature. Um, God's Dear Son is uh, also a tune that uh, in more recent times is better known um, by uh, a Cornish name that was given to it, and a Funyans, which means uh, the dawn or the awakening. Um, and it's a good example of a religious tune that gets adopted into the vernacular tradition gets a new Cornish names and continues its life as a trad tune. One of the uh, important bridging points, I guess, um, between religious and secular music in the Cornish musical tradition are West Gallery music and chapel bands. Um, local musicians wrote settings um, of hymns, psalms, anthems, and um, often local place names were sometimes used for titles of these hymn tunes. And um, one of the important collections of hymns or hymn books um, was one of a woman called Miss Harris of Trigoric Methodist Chapel from around 1890. Um, and it's a great example of um, how musicians played in social and religious contexts as well. Again, highlighting that the divide between these two worlds of religious and secular music perhaps wasn't as broad as um, it might be. I've just noticed in the chat um, a, a bit of extra information um, about the tune you've just heard, uh, where Hillary's um, said it was introduced to the instrumental canon by Bucker, um, uh, the uh, probably yeah the one the first um, Cornish band in recent times to bring traditional music to a commercial audience. Thank you, Hillary. Um, Methodism. Um, I have to mention um, the influence of Methodism uh, in Cornish society because it was so well rooted certainly by the mid 19th century and we do see this in our sources on what music was played and who played it. Um, if you have a look at this census by 1851 Cornwall has more declared Methodists than any other part of the British Isles and secular music and dance may have been 
frowned upon by um, perhaps um, the authorities in those um, Methodist establishments. But there still continue to be um, a beautiful intermingling of religious tunes being adopted into the vernacular. And indeed, you know, this is still happening today. Uh, Christmas time. So if you're talking about religious um, times and religious occasions is a, is a good example. If you look at Christmas time music of music that spans the religious and secular spheres. Um, and I think because uh, Christmas time celebrations are very family orientated. Um, we see this also in the sort of history of Christmas time traditions and music. There's a, a wonderful fictional story by um, a Mrs. Bonham who wrote um, a, an account called Christmas in Cornwall 60 years ago, published in 1898. And she describes the um, fictional village of St. Cadge, which um, equates to Cadgewith in about 1837. Um, where family carol singing, mama's plays and West Gallery bands um, that comprised people playing the bass viol, the flageolet, the clarionet and the great bassoon. And uh, later on in the webinar, we'll, we'll return again to um, some of these Christmas time customs and how they influence our music. Another short pause for some more lovely music. <laughs> called Royal Wedding, a processional tune um, that came from that manuscript I mentioned earlier, the Morville manuscripts from Morville House near Lou. Um, and it's called Royal Wedding. And this particular recording um, we made while um, Mike O'Connor and his Hantagantic quartet was showcasing um, some of Cornwall's historical music from these manuscripts at an event at Royal Cornwall Museum in August uh, 2018. Um, I wanted to share it with you um, specifically to highlight the instrument combinations. So you had uh, a couple of fiddles and the clarinet and the bassoon. Um, and woodwind instruments such as clarinet and bassoon continued to be favoured instruments in the Cornish musical tradition well into the 20th century um, and certainly um, beyond that too. Um, when you look at, for example, at the story of Ralph Dunstan, that really important collector and his family network, many of them were bassoon and clarinet and fife players. So woodwind um, is a, a very much a traditional instrument of uh, Cornish music. The other reason I wanted to share this particular tune with you, um, although as an aside, I should say, um, this is another example of a tune that has now uh, enjoys um, airing as a session tune, as a, as a Cornish session tune. We play it regularly at the Penzance Cornish session um, in a less stately uh, way than you've just heard. So sticking with this theme of um, the stately music from the, the big country and townhouses of Cornwall, um, another important piece of evidence for understanding women's roles in music is um, having a look at women's diaries. Now these diaries were generally kept by um, uh, literate educated women of the upper classes 
And um, we have several diaries dating from approximately the sort of second third of the 19th century to the late 19th century. And we observe women here as the organizers and hosts of parties and musical gatherings, um, particularly for the rich middle and upper landowning classes. Um, I'd like to share with you some excerpts from these diaries. Um, one diary entry written by um, a certain Caroline Augusta Edgecombe um, is dated to the 3rd of December, 1830. And she said, we had a very amusing soiree the other day at Lady Dudley Stewart's. There was acting tableaus, singing and dancing. Then another woman called Florence Gin writes from Tregothnan House. Um, this is much later uh, in 1884. This evening, Mrs. Fletcher sang again so well, and then Uncle Evelyn told me to sing again, which I did. And he said he liked it and my way of singing. Florence Gin writes again, this time from Prideau Place um, in Padstow. This evening we had a great deal of music, beginning with two toy symphonies, and I performed on the triangle. And that's dated to the 25th of February, 1884. Florence writes again the next day in her diary. Tonight we had a great deal of music. I have sung a great deal. My darling, I want to learn the violin. Um, so the women's diaries, really interesting sources. Um, I think for any of you thinking about um, doing uh, research into music, do have a look very much more widely at the context in which these women lived. Um, and I should say that the um, examples I'm giving you here are very uh, heavily based on um, the work that Mike O'Connor's done, who I've mentioned um, several times. And his great body of work is contained uh, in a two volume book called Illo Kerno, and it's in its fifth edition at the moment. Um, and I was struck um, particularly by um, uh, the emerging differences we're getting in um, the more industrialized society of Cornwall with the emergence of uh, Cornish towns doing things that are slightly different from the Cornish countryside. And in his description of 19th century town musicians, Mike describes um, the emergence of the, the middle class sort of almost professional musician. And some are mentioned by William Tuck in his reminiscences of Camborne dated to 1880. Um, one of them was a, a, a woman called Mrs. Wynne, um, and she lived at Four Street in Camborne and played the harp. And also in her household was a Mr. Wynne, a solicitor who played the Hort Boy, which is the old name for the oboe. And, and it did make me wonder whether this was a, a, a husband and wife duo making music. The tune you heard there uh, is called The Fly Cellar, and it's a um, modern tune composed by Neil Davey in 1998. And the recording comes from his book called Fooch, uh, again, an incredibly important collection of tunes, very much written for the, the modern musician and comprising CDs for those who learn by ear. Um, now, the, the 
he wrote the tune, he says, in response to the story of his great grandmother, Philippa, who played the concertina at Troyles in the fish cellars. And one uh, of these fish cellars in Newquay was called the fly cellar. <clears throat> Troyles are um, another feature of um, the Cornish traditional music um, heritage, uh, in a sense, uh, in that they have um, historical roots that have very much been um, reinvented and adapted for the modern day. Um, and if we turn to the um, to a, a book now called um, Scoop Dances, Troils, Furries and Tea Treats that was written by um, Neil's brother Merv Davy with Alison Davy and Jowdy Davy, um, also leaders of uh, Cornish set dance revivals of the modern day. Um, they begin the book with a quote that I'd like to share with you from the diary of Edward Veal, Merv Davy's grandfather, who lived in Newquay during the late 19th and into the 20th centuries. In his notebook, he described a memory of attending an event he described as a troil in the Unity Fish Cellars in Newquay as a young boy in 1885. His mother, Philippa, and uncle Ed Murrish played the concertina that night, and a man from Truro played the fiddle. He remembered the event involving dancing, music, and feasting on roasted herring, with the fun going on until the early hours of the morning. And Troils were also known to the folklorist uh, Margaret Courtney, um, a, another woman of Penzance, writing in 18, 1886 in her Cornish Feasts and Feast and Customs book, where she describes a Troil as Old Cornish for a feast. And in Edgar Rees's tale, the, again, um, fictional accounts are really useful in um, uh, painting, uh, I guess, a more vivid picture of the kinds of things that were going on in um, our social lives at the time. So Edgar Rees writes this tale called A Fisherwoman's Festival. And there's a description of a dance or troil following a successful fishing season. Um, that was then followed by a feast for those working in the pilchard cellars. And um, the people mainly working in these pilchard cellars were women. And after which there were games and dancing until the small hours and music was often provided by a fiddler. Delving into the uh, 19th and early 20th century newspapers, we can see several descriptions of troils of various forms. And it is a word that is also used more widely as um, a word for a good night out. And um, one great example comes from the report of the court case where um, one of the um, protagonists in this course, court case reported in the papers um, describes the fish troil as a drollification after a good catch of fish. And if you um, head to the cornishtrad.com blog, uh, Tom's written a really great blog post about troils and about some of these stories from the newspapers. So um, we've talked about the, the upper class women. Um, we have talked about some of the middle class musicians um, that are, are, are emerging because of the industrialization of society um, through the 19th century. And we've now visited some of the working people of, the, uh, of our fishing communities. So let's go from the coast to the fields. And now I'm going to try and share with you um, a, a little video. Um, a video
video of um, a dance called Cockin Bridges, and it's from the Cornish Jan Dance Channel on YouTube, where you can see uh, examples of other um, uh, Cornish traditional dances. Um, staying with the Davies work um, on um, scoot dances and uh, other types of traditional dancing, again, we see another collection of music and dance um, very much reliant on the memories and testimonies of women um, as the transmitters of Cornish dances and, of course, the music that went with them. And broom and broomstick dances were um, uh, performed by men and women, but they were primarily, primarily remembered by women. Um, such dances, broom and broomstick dances, continued to be performed um, well into the 20th century. And um, they mention the Truro Girl Guides, for example, continuing to do these traditional dances. The one you most often see today, um, such that you've seen in the video, um, is based on the Penzance broom dance, which was contributed by a Mrs. Watts of Madron in 1980. And this broom dance is either danced to a polka or a hornpipe. And one of the contributors was a Mr. Martin of Morville in 1980. And he also remembered a different tune being used called a uh, beautiful little tune called Blue Bonnets. Now, Cock in Britches particularly is uh, both a song and a mimed dance, a mimed lady solo dance primarily, and um, it's uh, associated strongly with uh, Cornish harvest celebrations or ghoul dies. And uh, the mimed dance tells the story of the harvest verse by verse. And the dancer uh, originally used to uh, wear an additional length of fabric, we're told, in her skirt, turning it into quite a dramatic wing for the chorus part of the song. But that's um, uh, rarely seen today. Now, the interesting thing with Cock and Bridges is that, um, unlike some other tunes, no other examples of this tune have been found elsewhere. And this particular version, the one we know today, was collected by uh, Mervyn Allison Davy from um, a woman called Mrs. Rouse of Treesmill near Parr in Mid Cornwall in Clay Country back in um, 1983. She was then 93 years old. And so isn't it interesting that so many of our testimonies we've heard about so far come from people in their 80s and 90s, and yet the music and dance they remember is still so vivid. And Arthur Biddick of Boscastle also remembered his primary school teacher dancing this particular dance. And it's a, um, specifically, as I mentioned, associated with harvest uh, celebrations and the old crying of the neck ceremony where the last neck of corn is ceremoniously harvested. And as that's done and the cry of the neck is done, um, the cock in breeches song strikes up and the dance was done by um, a woman holding a weeden paddle as a prop. Um, although this uh, weeding paddle was um, uh, uh, had a great big spikes in it uh, to get into the deep rooted weeds, but not so safe to dance with. So nowadays you usually see uh, people using a broom handle as you did in the video. And the Davies happened on this dance and tune because of a really interesting coincidence uh, that I wanted to mention because it also mentions um, other women in this story. Um, a, a friend of theirs, uh, Terry Jones, who was also involved in two of the early revival dance, Cornish dance group, Ros Celtic and Cam Kanuek, um, were, uh, was a friend of Daphne du Maurier, and it was Daphne du Maurier who also lived in that part of Cornwall in uh, near Parr, um, who uh, knew of Mrs. Rouse and, and made those connections. It's a short pause coming up. Arnon. Dow, Tree, Peswa.
wasn't that an impressive thing to watch? That was the tin stamp dance, um, which is a modern Cornish dance uh, made for the tradition by Alison Davy and Kirsty Cruz, um, originally in uh, 1988 as part of a folk play called The Hard Rock Minor uh, for the dance group Cam Canuek. Um, a great example of a dance to share with you because it combines most of the principal steps in Cornish scoot dancing and the tune you heard that went with it um, was composed by Merv Davey and again you can see more of these dances on the Cornish Dance YouTube channel. The tin stamp dance was um, intended to emulate the tin stamps and the great oak beams that were used to crush ore uh, in Cornish mines and evoke that repetitive industrial sound that would have dominated uh, the lives of everyone, um, but also um, particularly the bow maidens who were the, the women and girls who worked above ground on the mines. Um, the dance also uh, is a great showcase of other uh, types of Cornish dance and it, combi it combines steps um, from other classic dances such as the Boss Castle Breakdown, the Latter Pooch, the Forehand Reel and um, Mr Martin's Reel. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the performance I should mention that uh, you saw was um, uh, took place at the huge um, Inter-Celtic Festival um, in Lorient in Brittany and that was from 2015. Uh, one thing that's worth looking out for is uh, that Jowdy Davy is continuing in her family's footsteps, quite literally, and is working on a new second edition of the Cornish Dance Tutor Catch Up Your Heels, which will be out soon. Um, and if you head to the Anne Darris website, you should be able to um, uh, uh, see when that's out. And again, I will be adding loads of links on um, the Cornish Trad website as well as the Hypatia website. So let's have a, a, a another interlude for some more lovely music. <laughs> That was um, an excerpt from a tune called Mary Kalinax Polka, and the version that you heard is uh, was um, recorded by Fool's Rock, a musical collaborative from Red Ruth, and uh, it's from their album Ansem Little Place and their music is available on Bandcamp and also on Amazon. Um, I wanted to include Mary Kleinex Polka, not just because she's the subject of a traditional tune that we now play, um, but there's a fantastic story associated with her. The tune itself um, has an interesting story. It came, it was originally interpreted by Merv Davy from an imprinted fragment on the back of a portrait of Mary Kleinach held at the Courtney Library at the Royal Institution uh, in Truro. Um, and it's um, almost invisible on the reverse. And so the uh, sort of 1632 odd bars of it were interpreted by um, Merv Davy. And when we did some uh, more research into the um, held at the Courtney Library, we actually found, um, managed to locate a full copy of the music. And it was a polka written for the 19th century dance halls by Henry W. Goodban, who also wrote other polkas. The polka at that time being a very popular uh, dance hall dance because it allowed you to get up close uh, and dance uh, in uh, very close proximity to other people and was very much, um, you know, a la mode. And uh, turning to the original story of Mary Kalinak, um, uh, it's almost, it is almost fabled now, and it was famously and very colourfully illustrated um, uh, in the Illustrated News, and an excerpt of that is on the cover of um, Henry Goodband's music. Let's see if I can, um, while I'm talking, share with you uh, her portrait.
So Mary Kalinak, um, uh, depending on what you read or believe, she was either from Penzance Paul or uh, Newlyn, and she uh, achieved fame by walking from Land's End to London for the Great Exhibition of London in um, 1851 um, at uh, the grand old age of um, uh, sort of 84, 85 or 86, depending on what you read. Um, and she was very much noted at the time, and uh, the papers reported her story. Um, uh, and again, depending on what you read and what you believe, she did this incredible walk to either make sure that Cornish fishing folk were remembered and recognised as part of the exhibition, or to exhibit her traditional fishwife's costume as the Queen wanted to see it, or give the uh, um, or she went there to give the Queen a turbot, or um, she went to um, have tea with the Lord Mayor and then gets uh, noticed by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. So the whole story is full of um, uh, a lot of fable, but it's a wonderful story nonetheless. And we've got this great piece of music originally written for the dance halls and now part of our musical tradition as well. So from the polka, um, we're going to now turn to probably what is um, Cornwall's most distinctive communal dance and also kind type of dance tune. And um, that is the furry. So I'm now going to share with you some more music. Um, all of you recognised uh, that tune as Helston Furry. Um, as I've mentioned, um, so it would be widely accepted that the furry is probably Cornwall's most distinctive communal dance, and we have many, many um, tunes and music to go with the furries. Um, the, um, the furry is really um, a dance for... Uh, feasts and fairs, and the Cornish word fair being uh, the origin of the word furry. Um, and the most famous of these is undoubtedly the, the Helston furry. That was uh, probably dates back at least when it was recorded uh, in some kind of publication to 1790, if not before then. Um, in 1823, when Davis Gilbert publishes his um, uh, second edition of uh, carols and includes this appendix. He includes the Helston foray as part of that, and he's already um, he's already describing the Helston foray as an ancient specimen of Celtic music. But it was really um, a, a woman called Katie Moss, not uh, uh, not from Cornwall, but from elsewhere, who. Um, took to this tune and incorporated it into a composition she wrote called The Floral Dance in 1911. And it, it, that's what then launches the Helston Furry tune into international fame and also becomes um, known very commonly as the Floral Dance too. Um, uh, I'll just also share with you a, an image of um, another woman, um, very influential in um, the story of Cornish traditional music. So hopefully you can see a... picture, um, it's a bit of a ropey picture of a great big um, furry dance in action and this dates from 1921 um, in St Austell um, and it's Mary Trefusis there at the front with um, Henry Jenner um, uh, Henry Jenner 
big exponent of the Cornish Celtic revival from the early 20th century. And Mary Trefuses was a big player in the English Folk Dance Society, now known as the English Folk Dance and Song Society. And she organized several folk dance festivals in Cornwall and they were attended by literally hundreds of people going into the thousands. And they were organized in all sorts of places like Penzance and Austell, Lisk, Falmouth um, and uh, elsewhere. These kinds of mass dance festivals tended uh, to go out of fashion from the um, 1960s. Uh, and also contemporary with um, uh, Mary Trefuse, I'd like to mention um, Catherine Jenner, who um, was, um, Henry Jenner was her husband, um, the person I've just mentioned. Um, Apart from her part in raising awareness of a, of a distinctive Cornish Celtic identity since the turn of the 20th century, she was also a talented and celebrated poet. And two of her uh, beautiful poems were set to music by Ralph Dunstan, the um, collector and um, composer musician I mentioned earlier. Um, and they appear in the Livo Cano Konuek or the Cornish Songbook. And two of these are The Boats of Senon and A Grey Day. And I wanted to make a particular mention of um, The Boats of Senon, which is also known as the Cornish Fisher Girls song. And uh, Dunstan sent, set, set it to music in 1928. Um, and in particular, um, I was really delighted to, to find in a, in, a, in a lovely novel I'm reading, and I think you're here, Catherine. This is The Visitor by Catherine Stansfield, which I um, heartily recommend to you. There's a, a lovely verse in this song uh, which goes, the corn is in the shock and the fish are on the rock and the merry boats go dancing out of White Sand Bay. I hear the hues cry and I hear I, and I see the dappled sky and it minds me of the days that are long gone away. Um, Absolutely beautiful verse. So here we're seeing women, um, Catherine Jenner as a lyricist, as well as um, seeing music, um, women as the subject and transmitters of this music. Um, I mentioned earlier the, um, uh, the Christmas time traditions and uh, how Christmas time is a, a great period to uh, to look at in, in this seasonal year to see where the religious and, and secular blend together um, and uh, I'd like to share with you a tune um, now that is um, very heavily associated with the West Cornish tradition of geese dancing and here is um, a tune key rhubarb short pause <laughs> That was a, a recording of Turkey, the Turkey Rhubarb um, that um, was uh, performed um, actually during a practice by the Penzance-based uh, Cornish dance group Tros and Trays. And uh, you, you will have uh, probably heard uh, also the, the scoots on the bottom of the dancer's shoes. Um, Turkey Rhubarb is another great example of a tune that has travelled widely and it's um, a tune that's known throughout um, uh, throughout Europe and um, by various different names, um, including Patsy Heenish the donkey and Father um, Murphy's top coat. Um, but I'd like to just uh, play you uh, a bit of an old interview that was recorded by um, Ted Gundry for the BBC with one of the Madron Geese dancers back in the 1970s. And then you can um, hear how uh, music is um, claimed as one's own uh, when in fact it's very widely known. We used to meet on Madron Green 
just below the church and we all got together and then we'd lead off and we'd go to the first house that we came to. Now, what actually happened then when you got outside the first front door? Oh, we played on the cardinal. Now, wait a minute, what's a cardinal? <laughs> oh, you don't know nothing. Why is it concertina? We had a very old-fashioned concertina when we started first, and then we had to have an accordion because the concertina was so much blowing, it he, he blowed itself out. <laughs> so then we had to have the accordion, and they played Trelawney outside the door, and then the old people would know that uh, the geese dancers had come. Now, once they'd opened the front door, would you wait to be invited inside, or did you just march oh, in? No, we went right into the kitchen. So you didn't wait to be asked? Oh, no. We just opened the front door and went right in and formed ourselves up into a semicircle. And the old people would be sitting at the table and we uh, start chatting and and then say, we are the geese dancers. So, and the old woman would say, I got two eyes in me. I can see that surely to the Lord. Then you actually went into the pageant or yes, the, into did. the various verses which each yes. person had to say. Well, started off with Father Christmas then went to Beelzebub, and then St. George stepped forward, and they did all the pageant of the fighting and the doctor and all like that. Then we did the broom dance and the bones and all like that to finish up. Were there any other instruments to use? Yes, my son. We had a one-string fiddle, and that was made with a cigar box and a piece of wood for the stem of it, and then uh, catgut. They made the bow and uh, they used to play it and they played uh, all sorts of things on it. You could play, get a tune out of it, no Ooh, problem. Lovely, they used to play the turkey rhubarb with it. Now, the turkey rhubarb, what exactly is that? That's a local tune, my son, and that is absolutely peculiar to Madron. And it belongs to the Madron Geese Dancers and Madron Feast. It's very much like a, a polka, but not quite. I, should... I don't think um, that requires much more comment except to illustrate um, how music that uh, is quite well known can be made uh, your own as part of the tradition. Um, and, you know, a beautiful voice and a beautiful description of this great Christmas time tradition with some of uh, the music that went with it. Um, now, um, I'd like to follow up. Um, I, I struggled with this actually, is uh, how can you have um, a webinar or a workshop or whatever about women and Cornish traditional music um, without um, the absolutely stupendous um, uh, personality and musical talent um, that was Brenda Wharton. Um, so let me share with you um, one of my particular favourites. <laughs> Um, that was, um, and as uh, Hilary noted, um, a, a young Neil Davy there accompanying Brenda singing um, what's probably the oldest Cornish tune and song we know, um, commonly known now and largely thanks to the work that Brenda Wooden did in promoting Cornish language song. Uh, it's called Delio CV or Delkio CV, which means strawberry leaves. It's also known by other names like Where Are You Going and Where Be Going Pretty Made. And uh, the tune um, itself uh, gets associated lyrics um, in a kind of slightly sort of separate way we find the tune in again going back to the Sabine Baring Gould collections but in his personal manuscript um, we find that very distinctive um, tune um, being written uh, being written down I should say and Brenda Wilson very much brings um, this uh, song 
and um, very many other old Cornish songs um, into sort of popular uh, the lyrics I didn't uh, I forgot to mention the manuscript that they actually come from are in the in, Cor in the Cornish language originally and date to 1698 and they're in the Gwarvis manuscripts um, now in the British Library. Um, it, I mean, Brenda deserves a you know a whole series of webinars in terms of what her influence on Cornish traditional music has been, um, and I'd, I'd warmly recommend that you um, get hold of a recent biography written by Sue Ellery Hill. You may see it just in, in my little um, rickety display behind me uh, about Brenda because it's a brilliant insight into um, her thoughts about uh, music and about Cornwall and she really helped keep um, um, uh, these old songs refreshed played and recorded um, and they the old songs um, uh, sat very well with the more contemporary songs she was uh, singing, written uh, particularly those written in Canuek um, by one of her lyricists, Richard Gendel, and uh, and others. And some of the other um, folk songs that um, we that Brenda recorded, you can actually find in Ralph Dunstan's second collection of tunes called uh, Cornish Dialect and Folk Songs that was originally published in 1932. And these include songs like The Old Grey Duck, Tom Bocock's Eve, uh, we Be or Whip the Cats, Maggie May, uh, and the Ringers of Eglos Hale, um, and others. And uh, her life um, spans a very important period in this story because of the commonly held belief that um, from World War II to, say, the 1970s, that traditional music died out and no one was doing it. And this was certainly not the case in Cornwall and certainly not the case um, when it comes to the work Brenda and the very many people that collaborated with her um, took part in. So um, I'm going to take a little bit of a longer pause because we're going to end the webinar now um, with excerpts from um, an interview I did with um, two leading lights and for me personally great inspirations for getting involved in Cornish traditional music, um, Hilary Coleman and Francis Bennett uh, who are here in the chat today. So we're going to pick up the story um, with um, Francis talking about um the um, time when um both hillary and francis were playing in the jack and jenny band and um about the vision that uh, they and others had for the music they were playing we were very inspired by breton music as opposed to scottish or irish music which tended to be the inspiration for the dance bands that i played in previously where there was not the same approach of improvisation and sort of hypnotic melodies and the kind of things that would go on to become part of Dalla. And so you could tell, you know, even though we were playing very rough and ready at Maisie Day, you know, um, Simon Lockley would talk very seriously about the pursuit of excellence and the vision that Hilary mentioned. <laughs> I have never heard anyone talk about a vision of Cornish music moving further. And I've been in Ross Celtic for several years. What was the vision? The vision to have Cornish music as a as a world class world music to have it to have it on CD because it was not recorded in any way um, and to have it on the concert platform as well as you know um, in kind of small venues and for everybody to just um, get out there all this great music that and these great songs that nobody was um, was performing. Um, I think the other thing was we like Francis said we we wanted to. We wanted Cornish people to know about Cornish mm. music, and um, it—I mean—it was so remarkable. I mean, you know, I know that you're going, probably going to go on and ask us about this, but the knowledge of, of of our Cornish music was woeful in a way. I mean, you had—you know—they knew Helston Furry, they knew Trelawney, Mel mm, Pabstow May Day uh, song. Uh, uh, and that was probably it. And people said there isn't any Cornish music. There is no such thing as Cornish music. You it's all made, made up. up. Yeah. And honestly, the you you, you would you, you would not believe some of the prejudice that came up. I mean, we used to have. I mean, I remember Francis probably remember um, me getting a bit uh, irate with a guy because he said to me, "Oh, it's 
you're playing Cornish music. That's a bit parochial, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and it's lack of, we'll talk about lack of vision. Like, people, oh, it's okay for people in Ireland to have this amazing culture, but you can't have it. Oh, why not? Why not? You know, and that was our vision. Simply, it doesn't matter it's science. Can I just say another yeah. thing as well? I think actually it was a, a it was slightly there was a negative side to this sort of little Celtic music ghetto thing that we were people were operating in because people were constantly on the back foot and thinking all our music was rubbish because we're not Irish, we were not Scottish, we were not Breton, oh, and wow. our revival was nothing like theirs. And um, I think a lot of people found it quite difficult to actually appreciate the 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 stuff that we did have you know you would get people who were absolutely passionate about music from elsewhere folk music from elsewhere just because they didn't really think Cornwall had anything by comparison whereas I'm quite glad in a way that's one this is also anticipating a little bit but I'm actually glad that my daughter and her friends grew up not in that environment of going to Celtic things and going oh they're really good you know and their costumes are great and they can, you know they're all professional and they've all been on tv in fact they just grew up with a bunch of people who really liked the way they played and that was what Nosloan gave them you know so that's kind of way of looking at it I think for, for me. Uh, that was um, Francis and um Hillary reflecting on um that that vision that was um beginning to be formed um uh, uh sort of from the uh, I guess the um late 80s and early 90s about um you know what the full potential of Cornish traditional music could be um, and then I later asked them about um the uh, impact of professionalization um, on uh, Cornish traditional music, its use uh, to produce high quality um, professional albums and the like. So let's pick up the story there. Make sure Cornish music is enjoyable in an inclusive way. Uh, how did that relate to that moment that Neil Davy arrives? And I don't think it's an easy thing because as soon as you want to start developing, get better, uh, you know, it naturally people who, who who aren't and was there with you are going to feel left out and I myself have that experience and I think many many people have that experience in music I don't I wish it wasn't like that but sometimes it feels like a ladder there's some people are above you and you're to aspire to and other people are below you and you know you tread on them and that's not nice I don't like it but um you know, and one of the, I've always felt that the session model was fantastic because it's about a circle and that we're all equals. And there's very few other music genres where that can happen. And even though Neil did bring that professional quality, he was also very, very open and accepting of, yes. of beginners and people joining in. And he, he, like myself, have always loved to push the music out you know, not just I'm the best and I'm going to keep it all to myself. It was never like that. Um, it, the idea was, that I think for me, we, we then moved into Dalla, as you, you know. For me, Dalla, we always saw Dalla as a bit of a, an ambassador for Cornwall to show the excellence if we could. That doesn't mean we thought nobody else could. We want, in fact, Neil keeps going on at me, going, oh, when, when are all those other amazing bands going to happen? I mean, that sounds probably a bit condescending. <laughs> but, you know, you know, that excellence, you know, doing a proper recording. And I mean, a, you know, where, where you really work hard and you, you spend three weeks in a studio, which costs a lot of money, mm -hmm. but you're prepared to spend that money because you want that music to be excellent. So we hear some um, views about um, that important balance of um, uh, being a professional musician when you're involved with traditional music, um, but also the importance of keeping things inclusive. Um, and um, a project that is um, both incredibly pioneering and uh, inclusive is the one Francis uh, Bennett leads, Bagus Crowd, um, um, which means um, band of fiddles. And we'll let, uh, let Francis pick up that story groups and the sound of multiple fiddles whether they were Breton or Scottish or or whatever for a while um and also remember Graham Allaby Hillary there was a guy who um 
wanted to set up a fiddle group and he didn't in the end do it but we used to chat about he, he taught and repaired fiddles lived in salt ash at the time um and uh he was very inspirational in terms of someone just getting up and doing something and gathering the skills along the way um so anyway I had in the back of my mind, yeah, I, I want, he was going to call it the Kerno Fiddle Team, the KFT. Yeah. And I, I love this idea and me and Graham had plans, but then, you know, it, I don't know what happened. I think he moved away or something, something happened. Um, so I did, I spent a few months researching um, and just, I wanted people that I taught because I was teaching a few fiddle lessons, not a lot actually, but I was aware that my students were not playing in between lessons very much and they didn't have an outlet and they weren't going to bump into Cornish folk music during the week as Hillary was saying you know there weren't so many opportunities there weren't so many sessions that people the music wasn't you know people weren't listening to their cds because they, they you know there weren't any um no there must have been one or two by then oh no when did you record Richard Vane 2001 I think yeah, yeah so then you would have been just doing that just before I started Bagus. so um so I I um I suppose I would have probably just rung up half a dozen people and said that I was starting this fiddle group and um, um, or emailed them probably. And so it started in um, 2001. Yeah, 2001 in my front room with six people. Um, and it what I didn't know. I All I wanted was to get people together to have a bit of a jam on the tunes that we were maybe working on in their lessons. So if you so we had a small repertoire of tunes and um, people liked the idea of what I was doing. So people would kind of drop in, you know, Neil, for example, and people mm -hmm. already played really, really well, which was fantastic because I wasn't actually sure about leading music then. I hadn't really done much. Um, I also asked um, both Francis and Hilary about some of the music that they have composed for the tradition and the subject of the famous um, Cabin Pemp or Cornish Five Steps came up. So let's hear from them about um, how that came about and how now it's such a staple, uh, particularly of um, Nos Lowen events. And uh, I mean, I remember me and Neil sitting in bed just talking about Cornish music. I'm going, please, I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> I mean, I think I think the cabin pemp was invented in our bedroom, actually. <laughs> You've heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might say otherwise, but I certainly remember doing um, the Corella and uh, you know, in our bedroom, <laughs> trying out of the five step. That's for sure. <laughs> I never heard that before. <laughs> I'll ask Neil, maybe he will remember. <laughs> I was wondering whether you could uh, now talk a bit about some of the tunes you both composed for the tradition, um, how these came about, and, and maybe, uh, if I was to push you, which would be your favourites? <laughs> One of my tunes that I was, do like is, is a 541 called Anken. And the reason I like it is that, again, it's an emotional response, and I had read... Um, Sebastian Fault's third song and he had talked about how the Cornish miners had been in the trenches and they'd been asked to tunnel underground and it's the first time I'd ever heard of anything like that and I, I, I couldn't believe it I mean the trenches themselves were bad enough but the fact that they were they were at war in tunnels it did I just felt so distressed and I remember Neil coming to bed once not just in bits I was like floods of tears and I felt I needed I just I needed to have a response to that and I wrote Anken which means sorrow um, and it's got what I like about that tune is that it's got it's kind of got an anger in it as well as sadness which is how I felt it's kind of like means a lot to me yeah and about some of the tunes you've composed and how did they how did they come about well I haven't written very many tunes um and um, somebody did tell me once that when I die, there'll be this tombstone saying, here lies Francis Bennett. She wrote Olengerio because there is this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, let's just say about Olengerio. We had this tune, Corella, and there were a couple of others, maybe Nights and Nook to Nothing Kind, that we'd, we'd uh, adapted to make by four. But Olengerio was like the first final tune that really worked as a proper 5-4. Not only that, it's just a brilliant construction, even if Francis didn't mean it to be. <laughs> it's got a brilliant way, I mean, um, teaching 
Sky 4, I always think Colin Cario is, is a really, really number one example of how to how to play 5-4. And it's got such a good pattern and a repetitive rhythm that you, it's a really good way of getting into it. So, yes, I think it should be on your tombstone. Great. I'm very pleased to, to hear that. Um, it, it... Um, the last piece of this interview uh, that I want to share with you before we now move to um, finishing this webinar um, is I asked Francis and Hilary about their views on things like gender differences and the um, perception of um, how gender works in terms of uh, the Cornish tradition, Cornish culture, uh, etc would have been in the brass bands in chapel in the male voice choirs they would have been dancing drinking going to festivals and they would have done all those things and then and they would have been working in the fishing and the mining and they would have been cousin jacks and they would have done all the farming and then suddenly all the, all those industries collapse you have immigration you have you have wars so by the time the um revival comes along we're in this landscape that's like a weird monument to this young Cornish working class man because it's like created by them isn't it all that like if you look out of your window I mean practically everything and, but they are not here Cornish language is revised mainly by posh um, people so that connect with Cornish young working class man um, and then when you have us along we come a lot of us women and get people involved in well what should we do well we'll have you know we'll revive dance groups and dance groups now what do they do but say we have no young people we have no men and um because i think there is this idealization of of this this lost this lost person the young the cornish working class man who was like really on top of all these areas that i mentioned and i i don't know if you've um caught up with um, Alan Kent's book. If Nosloan is criticised for not taking off as a movement because there's not many youth, there's not the youth involved, there's not the fusion of other musics involved, which youth might do, there are not men involved, instead there are, you know, too many women involved, um, that kind of, that's exactly why, because the people who are doing things now, as well as, you know, as Hilary said, you know, the biological um, side of things, most people who go out and do stuff in communities are actually women churches are run by aged women you know if you look at all those different organizations i mentioned earlier um a lot of them have either disappeared or they're run by very old people or they're run by women so i think the time has come to celebrate the fact that the women are doing the stuff and i i i, I had a baggers meeting recently I and mean, we never have politics in baggers but we had a meeting recently where two guys we have an agm very informally every year two people in the group their daughters have just gone to uni and in the group that morning there were no young people at all there were only people you know us adult people and um it, there was a discussion on whether we should recruit how we should do it should we have a website etc etc and i just felt like no no i don't i can't do that again no it's not my that's not my thing i don't want to do any of those things the following week when we had our baggers practice um two people came in who played the cello they were not children and they were not you know they, they they weren't young people and i just thought well i rest my case i i'm going to teach anyone who comes through the door and hillary has a a mantra which is attraction not promotion and i really believe in that because i think we shouldn't be running around trying to attract the elusive young cornish working class man or yeah. young people. someone else can do that you know someone that we if we have in Bagus, we have one young girl of 12 who is actually becoming quite a good player well she doesn't mind that we're not in her age group and you know it's interesting that it's a girl as well and you know she'll probably go on and lead things so that was kind of my my sort of uh reflection because what would be your respective messages specifically to um women and girls interested in getting involved with Cornish traditional music i would just say you know i would say the same to any person whether it's female or male but it's usually women who lack confidence more than men and it just is you know they just doubt themselves so much more and i would you know just say you've just got to believe in yourself you've just got to believe in what you're doing and try and do it in the kindest possible way without hurting other people <laughs> you try and be the best you can you know that thing of when you stand in the sunshine someone else falls in your shadow some of us are in that kind of mentality but actually it's up to that other person to step out of your shadow you know we've all got our own there's enough sun for everybody wasn't that a lovely sentiment um to end sharing um 
as I said, very short excerpts of a much longer interview that I'd encourage you to watch. Um, so I'd like to now round off um, the webinar um, and um, uh, I guess give you some of my own reflections um, as a woman um, involved in Cornish traditional music, both as a, a researcher and a player. Um, certainly it's a world that I have found, um, uh, you know, by and large very inclusive um, I haven't noticed, like you might in other sort of musical genres, um, um, great divisions between men and women, for example. Age may play a bigger role in um, sort of deciding what of Cornish traditional music ends up getting kept cherished um, for the future. So thinking back to some of the women and some of the music that I've shared with you this morning, um, I was thinking it could easily stand up to being um, a, an overview of traditional music more generally without needing to find or emphasize the women because they're all there, they're all waiting to be found. Um, yes, some of them are, are not visible, um, but so very many of them are visible, uh, whether as rememberers, collectors, composers uh, or performers. And um, I very much feel that we're, we're part of a living tradition and um, that Cornish traditional music isn't fossilised in the past, but it can still trace its history of um, recreations and um, the cherishing of those uh, music uh, songs and uh, events that we hold so dear. Um, and largely we are have been reliant on women's memories and creativity to, 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 to carry that forward into the present and the future. So um, I'd just like to end by warmly encouraging you to enjoy more music from Cornwall. I hope this has given you some insight into the, the richness of our musical tradition here. Um, please do follow up on the links and um, the, um, the, both the links to more music, to buying books and CDs um, that I will share with you, um, uh, you know, in, in the following days and weeks. And please do keep in touch with the Hypatia Trust um, and the Women in Music Project and please do get involved. So um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, uh, if you can still um, ask questions, uh, if they come to you afterwards, as I said, you can still use um, uh, the chat to get in touch with me or you can get in touch with me via the Hypatia Trust or the Cornish Trad dot com blog um, but I would I'd, I'd just like to end uh, this broadcast now um, by sharing you um, some music from uh, two more fabulous women um, uh, Lizzie Pridmore and um, Emma Packer um, uh, when they were playing as a duo as Salt and Sky and this is the uh, amazingly inspirational uh, performance of the old song the Eglos Hail Ringers but these five boys from Eglisel could all the rest I'll do. There was Craddock the called Wainer, he rang the treble bell. Jan Ellery was the second man, and few could him excel. The third was Paul of the Carpenter, the fourth was Thomas Cleave. And good fellow, the tender man, he rang them round so brave. That livery meant and two demons and maven and St. But these five boys from Eglisel could all the rest I'll do. 